Fighter aviation has come a long way since World War I, from pilots literally dropping bricks and firing revolvers at each other from open cockpit airplanes, but soon they found a way to mount machine guns on them, and the real evolution of fighter and bomber aircraft began. Then, in the interwar period, technology advanced rapidly, but this was still just a warm-up for what was about to come when the next war finally erupted, as we humans seem to love finding the best ways to destroy one another. Going into the 1930s, all-metal monoplanes with retractable landing gear were now the pinnacle of aviation at the time. Fighters that had these features, like the German Messerschmitt Bf 109 and very soon after the subject of our video, the Supermarine Spitfire, were considered revolutionary, as crude as they might seem from today's standpoint. Seeing how the Germans were developing modern fighters, the British wanted to keep pace and replace their ancient biplanes, like the Gloucester Gladiator, which were already outdated by the time they entered service. At first, there was the Hawker Hurricane, but that was not enough. And in 1935, the Air Ministry issued a request for a new high-speed eight-gun fighter, which set the stage for what was about to become the Spitfire. Through many errors and trials, prototypes, bottlenecks in production, and everything that could possibly go wrong going wrong, the British Air Force finally began receiving the first Spitfire Mark I in 1938, pairing them to operate together with the older Hurricanes. They were integrated into the Dowding system, a system designed to protect the British mainland from bombing raids, the kind that had so badly surprised them in World War I, when Zeppelins terrorized cities and killed hundreds of civilians. And oh boy, they were about to have a lot of work to do very soon. So, fast forward to 1939. World War II had erupted and fighter pilots were among the first to see action. At this point, the British had only about 300 Spitfires and around 400 Hurricanes. In Europe, the war was raging over first Poland, then France, with the German Luftwaffe's new and highly trained fighters in their 109s shooting down everything in their path. The 109 was, for a brief moment, considered the best fighter in the world. The E model, which outclassed early fighters so badly, had two machine guns and two 20mm cannons, which was quite substantial armament for the time. They were now about to clash with the first mark of the Spitfire over France, but everything would soon change drastically, as the next marks would improve one thing after another to give it the edge in the fight. However, tragically, for each of those improvements to be realized, many pilots had to die first. The Spitfire Mark I was powered by the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, producing about 1,000 horsepower, and was armed with eight 303 Browning machine guns. Now, eight machine guns compared to the two machine guns and two cannons of the BF-109 might sound impressive, but it actually was not. You see, those eight machine guns were spread across the wings, covering more than one meter at just 100 meters of range. While this did provide a wide field of fire, it was not very effective due to the small caliber and lack of explosive power. The German 20mm cannons fired fewer shells but with much greater accuracy, and often a single hit was enough to send a Spitfire spiraling down in flames. These early fighters were small, sleek, and designed to be as light as possible. Their only real form of protection was speed and maneuverability. With water-cooled petrol engines, a single bullet in the wrong place could sever the fuel, oil, or water line, and quickly give a pilot every reason to search for a field to crash land in if they were lucky. Before the war, the British had already experimented with fitting 20mm cannons to the Spitfire, but these early attempts proved notoriously unreliable. Even when the war began, some experimental squadrons equipped with cannons found them so troublesome that pilots actually requested a return to the older all-machine gun Spitfires. The first marks of the Spitfire even had trouble with the machine guns freezing in flight, locking up and preventing them from firing when needed. This issue was quickly solved by routing hot air ducts from the engine exhaust into the gun bays to warm them. You have probably seen photographs of those red patches over the gun ports on Spitfire wings. Those were made to keep the guns clean and dry before firing, after which they would be blown away. The first real clash between the Spitfire and the BF-109 came at Dunkirk, when Spitfires provided cover for the chaotic evacuation in which the British were forced to abandon almost all of their military equipment and barely managed to save their army. On the other side, the BF-109s were escorting German bombers. In these early dogfights, both sides were fairly evenly matched. The Spitfire could outturn the BF-109 especially at lower speeds, while the BF-109 had a superior roll rate at higher speeds and could climb and dive slightly faster. These early encounters taught both sides valuable lessons in how to fight one another, and laid the groundwork for the tactics that would soon be used in the Battle of Britain. On the ground, Spitfires were kept with engines hot, fuel topped up, and weapons ready so they could take off at a moment's notice. When an incoming raid was detected, pilots were ordered to scramble. They would sprint to their fighters, start them up, and taxi while strapping on parachutes, taking off as quickly as humanly possible. One of the interesting things learned in these early engagements was a quirk in the Spitfire's fuel system. The early Spitfires used float-type carburetors on their Merlin engines, while the BF-109 used direct fuel injection. 
This meant that if a Spitfire entered negative G-forces, the carburetor would flood the engine with fuel, causing it to stumble or cut out for a second or two. That was more than enough for a BF-109 to gain an advantage by diving away, and German pilots quickly learned to exploit this. British pilots, however, discovered that if they first half-rolled the aircraft and then pulled into the dive, they could maintain positive G-forces and avoid flooding the carburetor. Even so, the 109 still had a slight edge. This problem persisted until Beatrice Tilly Schilling came up with a clever solution, a small device nicknamed Miss Schilling's Orifice, which prevented the flooding and eliminated the German advantage. Later, Merlin engines would adopt pressure-type carburetors, which improved performance even further. But it would not be long before the Spitfire was facing the prospect of being outright outclassed in the skies. By this point, the fighting was fierce, with huge losses on both sides. Between July and October of 1940, the Royal Air Force lost over 1,000 fighters and 544 aircrew were killed. Then something bizarre happened, giving the British a rare stroke of wartime luck. A German 109 pilot, after an intense dogfight over the English Channel, became disoriented and confused. Thinking he was over France, he was actually deep over England. As he flew further inland, he spotted a training airfield. Fortunately for him, it was not equipped with anti-aircraft guns, so he casually landed his fighter there, convinced he had reached a German base in France. The British ground crew, stunned by the sight of a German aircraft landing as if the war did not exist, guided him into a hangar. Climbing onto the wing and holding him at gunpoint, they captured the pilot, who at that moment realized the catastrophic mistake he had made. In doing so, he handed his enemy an intact and, until then, still secret new fighter. The British could now examine it, take what worked well, and learn exactly how to counter it in combat. This event helped bring the Spitfire Mark V sooner, now armed with two far more reliable 20mm Hispano cannons and four 303 machine guns. The Spitfire now had, among other improvements, the much heavier punch that pilots had been desperately asking for. But their good fortune would be short-lived. In the second half of 1941, RAF pilots began reporting sightings of something strange in the skies. It was bigger, faster, and deadlier than anything they had ever faced. British High Command initially dismissed these reports, assuming they were older French aircraft that had been captured. In reality, they were looking at the Fokker Wolf 190. The Fokker Wolf 190 was now built on a completely different concept. It had a massive BMW air-cooled radial engine, a much heavier armament of four 20mm cannons and two machine guns, and a host of other new technologies. It was incredibly rugged, extremely hard to shoot down, and could easily outrun and outroll the Spitfire Mark V by a large margin. After the first few encounters, it earned the nickname the Butcher Bird, for very good reason. Losses were staggering. Spitfires were being shot down at an alarming rate and there was almost nothing they could do except to try to avoid direct combat. The only thing preventing the Spitfire force from being completely wiped out was their significant home advantage. They had radar and early warning stations, and they fought over their own territory, meaning that bailing out or crash landing did not automatically mean capture or death, as it often did for German pilots. They also had much more fuel endurance compared to the Germans, who had to fly across the channel and had only about 15 minutes to engage in combat before turning back. The RAF tried to adapt their tactics, coordinating multiple fighters to work together, but the real answer came with the Spitfire Mark IX. This was essentially the same airframe as the Mark V, but now fitted with a two-stage, two-speed supercharged Merlin engine, which performed far better at high altitudes. With this engine, the Mark IX could finally match, and sometimes even beat, the Fokker Wolf 190 in climb rate. The balance in the skies was restored, at least for a time, and yet again every improvement came at a terrible cost. For each lesson learned, many pilots had to pay with their lives before it could be realized. When talking about the fighting over Britain, there are almost no words that can truly capture the intensity of those battles. Allied and specifically British pilots knew that German bombers were coming for their cities, and they tried in every possible way to stop them. For example, Sergeant Ray Holmes ran out of ammunition in his Hawker Hurricane while intercepting a German Dornier bomber heading for central London. Knowing the bomber would strike the city if it got through, Ray chose to bring it down at any cost. He rammed the German plane with his fighter, slicing off its tail before spiraling toward the ground after the collision. He managed to bail out and survive. Remarkably, the German bomber crew also survived the crash. Fighter pilots were also tasked with intercepting the V-1 flying bombs, and there were even cases of pilots bringing these weapons down by flipping them over with their wings. There were many examples of heroism during that short but intense air combat over Britain. By 1941, the war had spread across the globe, and over the deserts of North Africa, the RAF and the Luftwaffe fought mercilessly. Spitfire pilot casualties were again horrific, but difficult weather conditions only made things worse. In 1943, the Spitfire Mark 12 entered service, equipped with the powerful Griffin engine, and the British now had something completely different from the first mark of the Spitfire. 
But the role of the Spitfire was also changing. The Royal Navy urgently needed a carrier-based fighter for the Pacific Theater, and one of the solutions was the Sea Fire, essentially a Spitfire Mark V adapted for carrier landings with an arrestor hook, catapult spools, and other modifications. However, the Spitfire's narrow track landing gear, poor forward visibility on approach, and high landing speed made it unforgiving for carrier operations. A horrific number of accidents occurred, and many pilots lost their lives during takeoff or landing. It was even said that landing accidents and damage destroyed more Sea Fires than enemy action. In the air, however, they now faced the Japanese A6M0, and they quickly learned never to try to outturn the far more agile Zero. Instead, the Spitfire held every other advantage, and pilots used these strengths to shoot down mostly inexperienced Japanese pilots flying aging aircraft. Still, the Sea Fire had a major problem with range, as it had never been designed for naval operations, no matter how much effort went into adapting it. Over Europe, the Spitfire's role shifted again. It now escorted bombers on high-risk missions over German-held territory. Due to its shorter range, the Spitfire mainly took part in shorter escort missions, while P-47 Thunderbolts and later P-51 Mustangs went deeper. The introduction of drop tanks changed the game for all Allied fighters, giving the Spitfire a little more range as well. By this stage of the war, the Luftwaffe was only a shadow of its former self, but it was still dangerous. Spitfire pilots flying deep into enemy territory faced not only fighters but also constant anti-aircraft flak fire, which had become the leading cause of losses. Dogfights were less common, and the Spitfire was now often used for ground attack missions, carrying 500-pound bombs under its fuselage. They swept roads and railways for German movements and provided close air support to ground forces. By early 1945, advanced versions like the Spitfire Mark 14 and Mark 18 were mopping up what remained of the Luftwaffe and German resistance. Losses were still high around heavily defended targets, where fanatical defenders fought on, despite the clear end of the war. By the end of World War II, the Spitfire had fought in every major theater in which the British were involved, and even on the Eastern Front in Soviet service. Throughout the war, around 3,700 British fighter pilots were killed. Roughly 12,000 Spitfires were lost due to all causes, including those destroyed on the ground. The end of World War II marked the beginning of the end for piston-engined fighters as jet technology took over. The Spitfire remained the main British fighter for several more years, but gradually shifted into secondary duties, making way for the Gloucester Meteor, Britain's first operational jet fighter. 